Corona, Miller Lite, uh, Miller Lite. Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim and I'll be uh, filming tonight. Andy Anderson will be moderating. The College of Complexes has been meeting it's, it's continuously since 1951. Yeah. At uh, 20 and right now, local meeting stuff? for our internet audience at 252901 West Madison Street. And we've been Cramp doing so weekly no. since 1951. The college of consists of the following Corona. format. Uh, um, the first, there's only two rules here one is one rule at a time, and the second is no personal attacks. Oh. We start off with a brief announcements period. Then we have our speaker who will speak for up to an hour. Then we have our question and answer period, and it's questions only, because at the end of that question period, you'll all have a chance to get up here and do what we call our final rebuttal period, or be able to take a few minutes to spot off your remarks. Usually the rebuttal periods run in about four minutes, but depending on how many are here and how much time we have left, we could go from three or up to five. All right. All right, I heard we had a speaker tonight. His name is Andrew Paterakis, candidate for Illinois governor. Alexander Paterakis has been a resident of Illinois his entire life. With that, he has seen the good and the bad that this state has had to offer. With four of our last seven governors ending up in jail, Illinois politics has become synonymous with corrupt politicians. He intends to change that. Residents of Illinois are frustrated with the state's growing debt, increasing taxes, and shrinking middle class. Yet the current Republicans and Democrats running the state have not provided solutions, only band-aids to these problems. Alexander wants to change how business is done in Springfield. We need leaders who are looking out for the people of the great state of Illinois, who will, want, who will take on complex and challenging problems face on and will not sacrifice the hard-earned money of the Illinois taxpayer. Let's welcome Andrew Paterakis. All right, All right. thank you guys. And I appreciate these forums because I, unlike a lot of people, love debate. Because if we don't have good debate, then this is not America. America's all about free speech. America's all about free speech, and I love these things. So I'm really looking forward to your guys' questions and rebuttals after all this. Um, I am from Vernon Hills. I'm from Vernon Hills, Illinois, so the north suburbs here. I went to college at Purdue University, where I was a civil engineer. I um, actually worked on a lot of the roadways um, when they widened 294. So sorry about that pain if you guys travel that way. But I wanted to do this because I was seeing where national politics were going. I was seeing where state politics were going. I lost a lot of friends. I lost a lot of family members to other states, and I asked myself, why is this? Why do people want to leave Illinois? I constantly hear people saying, I want to, like, three years till I leave, two years till I leave Illinois, and that was sad to me, because I love Illinois. Like I said, I grew up here, except for college, I went, I lived here my entire life in the north suburbs, and I love this state, and I've seen the role models that we put in place within Illinois, right? We have all our governors going to jail, uh, things not being getting done, Right, core democratic principles. We've had democratic legislatures for 30 plus years, um, and all these major issues that Illinois has faced have been kicked down the road. They, everyone said, "Oh, don't worry, we'll let the next generation take care of this. We'll let the next generation take care of this," and that's not a that's not a good precedent to set. So, what are the basics? And one of the core points in my view, one of the visions I have for Illinois is around education. So education right now is going to be more important than ever, especially secondary education, because jobs are being more and more automated. And I'm sure you see right now that, you know, taxi drivers are becoming Uber drivers, which have become automated drivers, you know, people with driverless cars moving around. Jobs will be automated at an exponential rate. And what do these people do? What do, what do people do for jobs that you know just have us just go to get their GEDs, go through um, you know high schools? Where, where do these people go? Because they're going to be huge. These these jobs are leaving, you know, just going away. So I've been a very strong proponent of K through 12 education so that kids can actually learn and figure out what they want to do with their life. And if that takes them to college, great. If that takes them to a labor union and actually they want to actually do a skill, because 
right now in Illinois, or just there's this stigma, and I grew up in the north suburbs, so there really was a stigma about using your hands for a living. Right now, everyone is told they need to go to college, and, and that's how it is in high schools now. You need to go to college to be somebody, you need to go to college to be somebody, but yet no one teaches you that you can be, make you know, three figures or a six figure salary with you know, welding, becoming a carpenter, becoming an, op, you know, an operations uh, worker on a highway. No one's teaching kids that. And we should embrace that um, and help kids. You don't need to go to college to be somebody with your life. So I'm, I'm really a big proponent of changing that and changing the funding system of Illinois. I don't know if anybody knows how Illinois schools are funded, but pretty much Cook County and Chicago get 90 to 80 or 90 to 95 percent of state funding. And that's not right because Illinois is not just Chicago, and that's, I know we're all from Chicagoland area, but you go downstate and you ask yourself why are Republicans winning downstate because ever so, there's a large growing population of, it's the sovereign state of Chicago and not the sovereign state of Illinois. And we need to change that because every kid deserves a chance. Again, if, if one kid takes a chance and does something, but it does something better than the next kid, but they're both given the same opportunity which America was founded on, totally fine, but we're not doing that. We're setting people up to fail right out of the gate. You see this in the city of Chicago through CPS schools, and look at downtown via Rahm Emanuel. You have these beautiful bus stations downtown. You have DePaul University getting a $300 million stadium where they can practice in the United Center, yet you have communities crumbling, and they're not investing in, in, these, in these communities. And you wonder why kids are turning to crime, why there's high violence rates in Chicago. It's because they're not given a chance. They're either told you're the rich or you're poor. And if you're poor, well, you can't actually make a living. You don't get an opportunity. You don't get a chance in the state. And that's not right. You know, people, I'm, I'm a proponent, you know, if we get our finances in place for education for all. It means if the kids want to go to a secondary education, they, their families make under $100,000, they can. Okay, and they can go to community college, hopefully a four-year college, like the state of New York just did. Because what they said, the state of New York said, was that if you want to go to college for four years, we will front you the bill. But you have to stay in the state for those four years or else you pay a, a fee, a penalty. And we don't do enough of that right now. We don't invest in our communities to keep kids here. 80,000, so millennials, millennials at loose terms, so between the ages of 20, and 30, um, I'm using that as the term millennial right now, 80,000 millennials lost or left the state, okay? 45, only 45% 45 of college students um, go, that are from Illinois go to colleges in the state of Illinois, yet all your taxes pay for Illinois schools, yet only 45% of students that go to college end up going to state institutions. So. That's not right. I mean, we have great colleges in the state, and what's happening right now with the lack of funding is killing this state. So that's what I want to do. And to bring something up, um, a little off topic on this, is that the current governor, and again, I'm not going to speak about bad, good, whatever, the current Republican Party, what they're doing, and they're doing, they're, they're actually acting very smart, and they're winning today, is that we don't have a budget, right? We don't. We haven't had a balanced budget since 2001. So it's been Democrats, Republicans. No one is. We haven't had a balanced budget yet. It's weird is that businesses like mine and your family incomes, you have to balance your budget or else you're on the streets, right? I mean, it only makes sense that the government should be able to fund itself and not overspend and operate. And yet, 15 years, no balanced budgets. So what the what I might see is almost proven fact at this point is what the Illinois GOP is doing is not having a budget because if you don't have a budget, schools don't get funded, social services, healthcare facilities don't get funded. So they're getting all the massive cuts they want by not doing anything. So think about that, right? They're not they're not incentivized to have a budget because they want to ultimately cut things and they're doing that without any one piece of legislation. Makes sense. And while our our uh, bonds, so our you know our finances, we're going to get down to junk status. We're going to be almost bankrupt within Illinois. That's how the credit agencies are going to see us. Yet, who makes the most money off of that? Illinois will be bailed out, and the, the United States isn't going to let Illinois high and dry. But bankers will make all that money off all of our tax dollars because they're going to get bonds that have high yields. So they're going to make interest that's going to affect generations down the road. 
and only a few people will make that money. And that's where all your taxes will be going. I think pension problem was an issue. That'll be a major issue. And I've taught, I've talked multiple times about taxes, right? And it's boggling to me, it's mind-boggling to me that as Democrats, we've had high property or high property taxes and high sales taxes, because those are not taxes on the rich. Those are taxes on the middle class and the poor. If you take extra money out of someone's pocket via sales tax, the rich can pay that. That's totally fine, right? If it's ten percent, five percent, whatever it is, right? They can pay that extra tax. But the people that rely on every penny, like most of the people of Illinois. It's stealing from them. Yet, when we come to income taxes, which is the only fair tax, we're all on the same level. We're all in the same field. Again, a rich person is not going to go, oh, I have to pay it. They're going to complain about an extra 2%, but ultimately we're going to miss that. No. I mean, my taxes are high. I complain when my taxes go high, but ultimately I can pay my taxes. So we need progressional income tax system. And a lot of Illinois lawmakers do not want to touch that because it opens the Constitution up. And there's a lot of things in the Constitution that both Democrats and Republicans do not want to open. And that goes to the fundamental issue is that politicians in Illinois over the past 30, 40 years, both Democrats and Republicans have not fixed key issues and let generations upon generations either leave the state or take the tax burden when people leave. Because ultimately when people leave, we don't get tax money from those people, right? We that stay here have to front that bill. And we're ever growing uh, liabilities and burdens of our state are falling on the people that actually stay. So that's why I want, I don't want to see property taxes go up. I don't want to see sales taxes go up like the city of Chicago just does, you know, arbitrarily. I don't want to see new taxes. I am a proponent for taxes when taxes go to their, their intended purposes, okay? Because if we just keep taxing things and not fixing core issues, your money is all being wasted. I mean, it makes sense. The lottery, just for example, talk about education. The lottery, 24% goes to education. They promised us 100% would go to education. But ever, all this money flows in this general fund, which none of us see. No one knows where it goes. We sort of know where it goes, but none of us know where it goes. Um, so when everyone talks about bag taxes, soda taxes, these taxes, is, it doesn't make sense to me unless we actually know where that money is going. So that's why I've, I've proposed lockboxing, partial lockboxing new incentives, such as if we do new gambling, making sure that at least a certain amount is locked to education. If we do the, if the legalization of cannabis, some of that money will be set aside and locked away so that politicians can't play politics and go, well, you know, we said all of this was supposed to go to education, but we're only going to get 10%. We're going to throw the other 90% towards an issue that we haven't fixed for four years. So that's what I'm a very big proponent of, is that if we do do new taxes, that we lock certain amounts of those taxes, certain percentage of those taxes to, to things that they're meant to do. Okay? Because, again, we all have taxes. We all know taxes are a necessity. But, again, if politicians are playing with those taxes and you don't know and wasting those taxes, then what's the purpose at that point? They're just wasting all your money. So there's that. what they said about the lottery. How are you going to enforce that? Well, I'll get to those questions. We'll get the question and answer session. See, I'm sticking to the rules. <laughs> I'll get you on that one. But I have an answer for that, sir. So we'll get to that. So, so that's where we are. And health care. Think about health care, too. Right? Is that I've, I've done my research on health care. I, I was going back and forth on this a lot. And, you know, Medicare for all almost makes sense in a way. And... There's a this, there's this stigma, and it's at national politics and it's at local politics, that if you get hurt, if you're a stay, have a steady job, you're, everything's going, then all of a sudden a catastrophe happens, that you should just be left alone and, okay, bad things happen to you, you get cancer, all right, go away. I don't want to pay for your health care. And that's a bad precedent. I mean, we're the, we're the United States of America. You know, we're supposed to be what everyone looks forward to go, you know, I, people, immigrants, love the United States of America. They keep talking about, I want to be United States of America. You see people from oppressed nations come here and say, wow, this is a wonderful place. Now, we do have our bruises and, and, and issues, but, you know, health care is technically not a right guaranteed in the Constitution, but it should be a right compared that we should be the, considering that we're the, what everyone looks as the standard of society. And yet we don't have that. I mean, healthcare costs are out of control. Families are going bankrupt for just mild. They get cancers. They get their, their kid has a pre-existing condition. All those things. So, 
I've said enough with the politics on this. Just Medicare for all. Let's get, make sure everyone is covered. Make sure our seniors are protected. Make sure that drug costs don't go out of control. You know, a lot of drug companies, right? In Canada, drugs are you know 80% cheaper. Yet we pay high drug costs in the United States. That's wrong. It's immoral. I mean, health is the one thing that keeps the society together, right? It's what how you live and die, and how and how uh, how that quality of life is. And yet we should be playing games. So that's why I'm a proponent for Medicare for all. And now look at um, women's health issues, right? It's always, again, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert about women's health. I mean, I'm not a woman. I don't, I don't claim to be yet. All the people making policies are males, adults that feel that, I mean, it just doesn't make sense. I mean, I don't know what women's issues are. I mean, I'm sure that they don't either. But yet, we force legislation on women's rights to choose. And that's not right as well. Again, everyone is, should be equal in the United States, and yet most people are not. All right. So that gets me to another point here about economic policy, right? Because politicians, I'm sure you're sick of hearing it. I mean, politics is everywhere now. But politicians always cater to the middle class and the poor, right? We're going to help the middle class. We're going to help the poor. I mean, it's the, it's the standard, right? Everyone talks about that, right? But when it comes down to it, they don't care. Okay. When it comes to the poor, you know, they talk about Black Lives Matter, all these Black Lives everything. When it comes to the poor, no lives matter. And that's that's the honest truth. Because they don't care about the poor. Why do they care? They're not paying their paychecks. They are not paying their corporations. They are not paying their bills. They don't care. They talk about the poor, but yet policy has not dictated helping the poor and helping the poor communities. I mean, you see that, like I said, brought up earlier with the city of Chicago. The poor communities are getting poor. The rich communities are getting richer. Rahm Emanuel is talking about these giant skyscrapers that are building businesses booming in Chicago. Yet on the south side, they're closing banks. They're closing communities. And that's not right. I mean, the true thing, what you would do if I was the mayor of Chicago, which I'm not, and I don't plan on being the mayor of Chicago, because again, I don't like being corrupt. But, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those things, right? Is that, Giving, you can't just fund, and again, it's not saying just throw money at communities, right? The, the reason why we have community issues within any community is the fact that we never, politicians and money has never worked with the community, right? We're not, we're not saying, here's $200,000, go do something, right? They, they force a school, or they force, not a school, but they force a project that no one wants in a community. You talk about why police relations are bad within communities, because communities are just seen as Throw money at it. Okay, give me so what we need to do is make sure that when money comes to communities that, first of all, communities are given a chance to use money to, to better their communities, but that political advisors work with these communities to make sure that we're building things and creating policies that help these communities out. Because every community is different. I'm sure you go to any section of Chicago, and not one section of Chicago is exactly the same. Crane, Village, Wrigleyville, everything like that. Not everyone's the same, yet we're forcing blanket policy against and saying we're all one, especially and especially in the west and south side which are crumbling right now. And again, building stadiums, building really nice bus stations downtown. I mean, that's not helping anybody. It's helping Ron Manuel's look good again to his rich donors, but it's not helping the poor. It's not helping people get off their feet with social security out of unemployment. That's not that's not right. And that's why we have issues in the communities that we have. So that's where I see that going. Now, I'm going to talk about some people's favorite topics, some people growing at this, but the legalization of cannabis. Okay? You know, there's some people, too, there's been no proven data that says cannabis is a gateway drug. Some people say that is the case, but there's been no proven data to that. Um, but we need to make money in Illinois some way. I mean, we can't just have all these programs coming up. Again, we talked about fiscal responsibility, which I think everyone at their home, right, is fiscally responsible. Some maybe bought something they shouldn't have in the past you know, couple months. But ultimately, we need to be fiscally responsible. So how do we pay for education? How do we pay for these things? And legalization of cannabis would be one way to partially fund uh, our budget. You know, they say between um, legalization, just a recreational use, hemp production. I mean, Illinois is made with a bunch of farmers, right? I mean, we're a farming community. The corn ethanol never really took off, so why don't we use hemp production as a way for farmers to have a different kind of cash flow? I mean, think about that, and the community, that, and the, 
the uh, resources that we bring. So you can gain, through legalization of cannabis, they estimate between 400 and 700 million a year in economic growth. Our last budget was out of, out of balance by about $4 billion. So again, it takes a little bit, every little bit counts. Okay. And also, in Illinois too, how do we cut, how do we cut, or cut our costs and gain things and, and gain revenue? Um, cannabis, luckily in Illinois, we've had decriminalization of certain amounts of cannabis. Okay, so luckily we aren't throwing people in jail anymore for you know minor offenses. Again, that's one of the big things. One of the big costs of a society is jail. And what we don't we don't do enough is reform people that go to jail. I mean, think about it, right? If we spent that money that we that we spend on lawyers to put people back in jail and the housing to put people in jail. We'd be a better society. Your unemployment would be lower, people would be off the streets. Again, it's the same thing with veterans. I'm not comparing veterans to the, the criminals or anything like that, but it's similar in the fact of when people go through issues and traumatic experiences in life, a lot of times people just say, okay, go ahead, go on your own. You're, you can fend for yourself. That's not right. I mean, in a society we have, it's cheaper to help veterans out, it's cheaper to reform criminals than just to let them commit crimes again. And, and uh, veterans to, you know, not feel comfortable and not find work. So that's very big and something where we need to change. So to move on to veterans issues, right? Veterans are doing one thing, right? They're not, they're not politically motivated. They're told to do a job, they do that job, they do it well, and they come back and they should be celebrated for what they do. My businesses, for example, um, are 66% veterans that come back. Um, one of my partners, we have three partners, one of my partners is a current active uh, uh, captain in the uh, US Army right now, he's a doctor. And we don't treat veterans, we, we, we always treat veterans with politics, right? Well, I didn't believe the, uh, the war in Iraq, I didn't believe the, uh, uh, Desert Storm, I didn't believe in Vietnam, so thus, you're nothing to me. And that's not a right thing to do. These people, the commander in chief, whoever that commander in chief may be, is telling these individuals what to do. And again, they have to listen. It's law. They have to listen to their energy. And we should be treating those people back, helping them get jobs within Illinois. Because again, I, I've talked to a lot of veterans, and I'm not trying to make veterans seem like the victims or anything like that, but a lot of a lot of people, a lot of my employees that I had had tough times assimilating back to regular life. Yet, we don't help those people. We just say, okay, go back and, you know, fend for yourself. And that's not right. And Mental health is one of the biggest issues we have in the United States. All the violence we have, all the, the psychological issues we have, are stemmed from mental health issues. And yet, we do not fund mental health at all. So that's where I see that going. And that's what I want to do is help businesses hire veterans, help businesses hire reform criminals to give them a chance. Again, a lot of these people want a chance. Let's give them a second chance. If they didn't take that chance, OK. But at least we gave them a chance. That's what I want to do. I know some of you are so, some of the people are socialists here and things like that. I'm I'm a capitalist by heart, but I believe in capitalism that works for all, and that if people make money, as long as they make it legally and ethically, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you don't and you have unfair advantages, then there's something wrong with that. Okay. Not bad. Last section I'll get to is about business in Illinois, and I know some of you. Uh, may not know, but Illinois is really hard to start a small business. When I started my small business up, it was very tough for me to do that. And one of the things I'd like to see, we give these massive corporations discounts on taxes. They don't hire the people that they say they hire. They hire a fraction of the amount, yet they get all the tax breaks. But small business owners in Illinois, we're stuck high and dry, and most businesses fail within the first two years. That's just the statistics. And that's not right. Why does a corporation get all these tax benefits, but yet somebody that's trying to actually create jobs in Illinois left high and dry? So New York did something right, and then what they did is that for certain industries like manufacturing and high tech, they gave new businesses a tax levy to say, you can come start a business here, hire as many people as you want. You know, we'll give you a tax break the first two years, and then you'll pay regular taxes just to get off your feet. And I want to do something similar to that because. Everyone's talking about raising the minimum wage, and what do a lot of, a lot of small businesses get afraid of? They're afraid of that, right? Because they say, "Well, my costs will go up. I'm going to have to put the cost on the customer, things like that." But 
if you, if the government were to subsidize, take taxes away from the small businesses, it puts relief that they can hire those individuals at a higher rate if, if they deem that necessary. So that's where I would see in how we can uh, form and create small business growth within Illinois, and then also be able to fund and, and uh, raise wages for, for uh, workers in Illinois as well. You know, and the, you know, the whole thing about raising wages and the unions in Illinois, I mean, unions grew up in the state, right to work laws, right? Right to work laws, I don't know if you know about Republicans, hate regulation, get a right to work law, which is pretty much saying that you don't have to join a union if you don't want to. It pretty much destroys unions. And what that does is, is it's a regulation. So it's what government, it's what Republicans go against all the time is regulation yet, right to work laws and regulation. And labor in Illinois has always been strong. It's raised wages, it's created better working conditions in Illinois, and yet we don't treat unions like that. We, everyone talks about pensions and all these fat pensions that some of these get. I'll tell you who gets the fat pensions. It's the politicians that get the fat pensions. It's not the, it's not the average Joe working and putting money into their account. It's the politicians that get the nice pensions. So that's where we need reform, and we need to stop criminalizing union leaders and unions because they're not the issue. It's the politicians and their pensions that are the issues. So I'll, I'm going to leave it at that right now. My, my, my you know, good you've, got, you've got some time yet if you need to elaborate. OK, well, I'll elaborate. I'll answer the question about funding, even though it wasn't question answered yet. But I got you well, on this thank our speaker. Yeah. Okay. I'm looking at your website. Yeah. Um, I see you've got a lot of uh, things you say you're going to do, but we've heard this before yeah. from Rauner. I'm going to reform Illinois. I'm going to do this. And all we've really gotten is just log jams and what I call non government things, our debts gone up, our things. I mean, what's going to differentiate you from the typical? drain the swamp, I'm going to make changes, they go in and they get nothing done because there's such an obstructionist legislature or they don't want to compromise, Yeah. what's the difference between you and some of these other candidates? Yeah, that's a great question. Think about this, right? What's the purpose, you know, you got Governor Runner complaining that he can't do anything since Michael Madigan causing all the issues. So I'm like, so what's the purpose of you being governor in the first place, right? I mean, that's what you're elected to do is govern the state. It's not govern the state unless it's Michael Madigan telling me what not to do. So that's one thing. Calling people, what Bruce Runner did is one of the biggest mistakes, even though he claimed to be an expert negotiator, was calling CPS uh, teachers illiterate calling Mike Madigan corrupt. I mean, I can tell you right now, any good any good negotiator doesn't insult or highly insult the person they're going to negotiate with, number one. You are right, though, that many people talk about things and that nothing happens. I've rejected all corporate donations. I've rejected all big money. I have only answered myself and the people that plan to support me. I've, with campaign finance, I've I've said, I'm not going to raise the big money of the Priskers and the you know, Kennedys and things like that because I don't want it because people, I mean, your money is your money. I don't want to take your money. It should go if you want to donate to something, donate to a charity because I'd rather give that money to a charity than to news organizations that spend your money and only they make the money, right? We talk about Hillary Clinton between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, $1.5 billion was spent on that election. Imagine if they went to something good, right? Yet they're talking about Illinois being the biggest... You know, it's going to be the biggest uh, governor race in the history of governor races. So that's what I've rejected, and I'm standing strong to that. Um, to go about about actual physical policy and a compromise, right? This this country was built on compromise. I mean, my parents were talking about all the compromise that used to occur. Right. But nowadays, it's either the Democrat way or the Republican way, and obstruct, obstruct, obstruct. People got along before this, and I'm sure we can get along. But I can get along with Mike Madigan. I don't agree with a lot of Mike Madigan's stuff as a Democrat. I don't. I mean, unfortunately, I just don't. But I'm not. You, you work with me, okay? I'm not going to get everything I want. There's no. I mean, I'm going to be selfish to think that. I'd be selfish to think everyone in this room would get what they wanted. But there's there's compromise that's good compromise, and these issues are being brought up now again. But it's keeping the momentum, like the progressive income tax. You know, that's been talked about for 20, 30 plus years but yet no one's done anything right. If we keep those conversations going, like all the candidates talking about, we're going to get, we're going to get issues solved. 
And where I think I can do better is that I can offer the Democrats in the House and the Senate a different voice to, to latch on to and to feel confident that they'll get their voices heard rather than maybe one person dictating what their voices are. And work with that individual, not call them corrupt. I mean, I'm sorry, that's just not a way to do business with anybody if you disagree with them or disagree with them. And, and Rauner's remark about training the swamp, cutting business, I mean, he blatantly lied about everything that he was going to do. He's a venture capitalist. He's never created any jobs. He's only cut jobs. He's doing what he promised, cutting jobs, cutting money within Illinois, but at the cost of a lot of things. He promised us uh, help, protection of women's rights. He promised us a new funding formula for education. He promised that he's going to bring business to Illinois. He's nothing that except make $180 million last year, which was $130 million more than he made the previous year he was governor. So, that's what I. That's where I see myself. As, as a corollary to your question, yeah. Chicago has history of corruption, everything from Hinky Dink. What's the two guys? Hinky Dink. Yeah. Hinky Dink Ken and Bathhouse John Coffer. They they would be accountable to the people and the city ran. We didn't hear about deficits and things in the twenties. I mean, isn't that? I mean. Illinois was running for a long time under the Mayor Daly, the original one. You didn't hear about streets and being not being clean, and people were held accountable. I mean, isn't that another way to run government sometimes? Yeah, it's making sure that people that are supposed to be doing their job are doing their job. And what's really, it's, it's really upsetting to me is that the Illinois Constitution states that state workers don't have to be paid, but politicians have to. I mean, that makes sense, right? And guess who's going to vote against that? <laughs> no one. And that's one thing that is, 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 is hypocritical. It's like, as Democrats, we're supposed to be protecting, protecting the people. I mean, it's either the, the core fundamental differences, there's tons of differences, is that Republicans want a decentralized government, move it to state, and then pretty much lower taxes for, and do trickle-down economics and things just run. Where Democrats want more federal government, they want more government, slightly more government, slightly higher taxes to pay for that government, and they ultimately want to help the people that can't help themselves. Yet, every single policy over the last 30 years, whether it be education, whether it be tax structure, whether it be property taxes, they haven't done anything. And, that, and it's, it's, it's boggling to me that these are Democrats that run the state for 34 years, yet they do not want to do core things because it's con it may be controversial and it may upset some people. It doesn't help their pocketbooks. Yes, sir. Yes, Alex, you, you, you seem you were advocating specified funding sources. Now, in 2008, public transit in Chicago and the region is funded through partially real estate, and the market dropped out. There was no funding for public transit. So according to your suggestion, the systems would have, Pet Metro Pace and CTA would have shut down for lack of money, because you say all money is specified, right? I don't want all money specified in the well, my lockbox comment, right, about lockboxing certain funding into yeah. certain things. I want, right now, the reason I'm an advocate of that, and, and not fully saying all cannabis money is going to go to education, or all, I want to legalize gambling, but not in poor communities, but in O'Hare Airport. You might as well take advantage of people with long layovers, and it may look a little gaudy, put it in a corner. I'm sure you make a ton of money off people just traveling through, and you're not, you're gaining money without you know, affecting, where do they usually put casinos, right? They don't put them in nice, rich areas, they put them in poor communities. That'd be a way to generate revenue. The reason I'm in for a temporary, not a permanent, like we had a safe roads amendment which permanently locked all transportation um, revenue from the tollways to transportation, is that because politicians haven't been accountable to anything. We talk about accountability, they say one thing and talk out their mouth on the other thing. I'm all for flexibility of money, but we gotta correct the issue first and hold that, hold those people accountable, at least temporarily. I would love the free flow of money between things, and if politicians were accountable, 100% agree with you. But I that's still right don't different. understand, sir, there'd be no money coming into the three services for about two to three years. And you say all spend all funding is locked. I would say all so what? that new. It comes out of the fare box the passengers would have to pay. Under your theory, 
transit fare would be five or ten dollars. Not fully, because what I'm suggesting is the lockboxing of funding would only be for net new tax regulation or net, net new revenue via taxes, not through existing systems that already are working, going through for any net new source of revenue that we collect. That's where I would be. So not the whole thing, just only net new. <coughs> Uh, I'll go, you, you asked the question first, sorry. You're not going to get anything out of automatic uh, again. You're not going to compromise with them. It's going to tell you what to do, and you're not going to get at it. No, I understand. And I understand that's been, a, that's been a biggest issue. And that's, I mean, I'd rather fight that than I would lay up and say, I'm going to do exactly what Mike Madigan wants. You can, well, say Bruce, you can say as Bruce Rahner said that too, right? Well, Rahner, Rahner's trying to fight him with the, 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 the state is stopped. But well, here, how are you going to get it going? Yeah. Mike Madigan calls the shots. No, and he's a, he's a daily, right? I mean, he's a cousin, I think, of uh, no, Mayor Daly. No, he's his own guy. He's a power. Well, they're connected in some way. And I'll, I'll pull it up, but I'm sure they're connected in some way. Well, they're. Well, well no, they're, they're, there's, a, there's a family <laughs> connection <laughs> within there. Yeah. But um, you're right, and that's what Ron are winning against. But I have a theory Ron doesn't want a, a budget because he's getting everything he wants without doing anything. He's getting his cuts that he wants. People are getting laid off. Teachers are getting laid off. Everyone's cutting costs now because they have no money to fund that. Michael Madigan has worked with, I'm not defending Michael Madigan. I'm saying he's worked with Republicans. He's worked with Democrats. I mean, the Edgar Ramp was in 1992, which pushed pension payments and, and used all the way to 2050. My generation was a Republican thing that went through the House and went through the Congress. So there's, there's ways to compromise on things. And if there's a voice, I'm sure if there's a Democratic voice, Blagojevich wasn't a good Democratic voice, we all know that. He had good set of hair, but that was about it, okay? His hair's not so good in jail, by the way, it's all great. He gave us all free transportation, don't, don't knock him. Okay, we also gave you free trade of uh, a Senate seat, but um, across state lines, but. He was a capitalist. Him and, him and Quinn both stole from pensions. They weren't, they weren't you know, true Democrats. Uh, they both borrowed from the pension funds, which they shouldn't have borrowed from. They took people's money away. But I can only tell you what I would do, and that's what I would do, is that I'm not going to agree with everything Mike Madigan would do. As a Democrat, I hope I have a little more leverage over another Democrat in the Congress than a Republican would, just by the sure fact of the political party affiliation. But... I'm not going to sit down and lay up because I don't want to do that. I'm not. I'm probably the only person in this whole race, okay, that has not personally called Mike Madigan. I'm not. Everyone else has because I've seen news reports that I called Mike Madigan doing this. I have not. And I think we have similar. We have similar views in some cases. We have distinct views and other totally separate views around property tax and things like that. But there's enough there to at least compromise and get something accomplished within the state where Bruce Runners. His agenda is so far out from Illinois values that I think that's where the, dis the main disconnect is and why nothing has been getting done these past uh, three years. Okay. okay sorry, the back. Um, do we need to change the Constitution of uh, Illinois? Are you suggesting a constitutional convention? And what would you propose to be changed with our state constitution? Well, a progressive income tax, we're one of five states that has, does not have progressive income tax, meaning that everyone's taxed at the same rate. Obviously, people that make less money, I think it's under $30,000, don't pay any taxes. I mean, that's how the federal law goes. But we would need to open the Constitution if we, if we wanted to do that. That's the really only thing. There's some pension reform that I don't want to, like, pension reform right now, I need really need to be union leaders and figure out how we make pensions work. Because there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with people making a pension. They don't get Social Security when they're on their pension. They don't get 401k. That pension, they pay in their pension thinking they're going to get that when they retire. So that's totally fine. So I wouldn't look at that. The only thing I would look at to open the Constitution up would be that progressional, uh, progressional income tax. Now, because that's going to take a while and no one wants to touch that right now, a compromise to start out with would be raising the income tax up to a certain level, say right now it's 3.5%, raising up to 55 6.5%, and offering tax credits for individuals that make under certain tiers. So let's say individuals that make under 100000 would pay the normal 3.5%. People over that 100000 would pay, wouldn't get that tax credit and would pay the full 5.5% or 5.5%. That's a temporary way to do that until we can open the Constitution up because that's going to be a whole legal battle. And a lot of people don't want to do that because they, they're, they're spreading the fear that 
if you open the Constitution, all these lobbyists are going to come in, and all these politicians will say, where's the money going? And then they'll tinker around with every little thing because all these lobbyists are coming in with money in the state of Illinois. To ease that fear, like I said, I would do a raise the tax, the income tax up, offer tax credits, but then work towards a tough issue, which is opening the Constitution and creating a progressional, progressional, progressional income tax. So would you pursue a constitutional convention? Not a full, no, I would just open, just shoot for the one amendment. Because right, right. there's nothing else that I would change right now in the Constitution of the state of Illinois that would be as high impact. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Before you can seriously discuss what you will do upon yeah. becoming governor, uh, and I, you may have covered this because yeah. I was a few minutes late. It's okay. Um, <clears throat> you got to get elected. Yes. And in order to get elected in any one of these United States, you've got to have a pretty good war chest, uh, or uh, you're going to be you're going to be left at the uh, in the back. Yeah. Uh, how do you intend to fund this? You said that you're not going to take uh, support from. Uh, big corporations or yeah. special interest groups and all of that sort yeah. of thing. Um, where do you expect to get the kind of money that would put you in the same league with the Kennedys and the Pritzkers and the people who have friends with big checkbooks yeah. and have big checkbooks themselves? Yeah, it's the, uh, what, what a lot of unions are looking at right now is how do I fight money with money? And that's what they're. That's what they think. That's why I'm. Again, I'll be honest with you. That's why they think J.B. Pritzker is the, the best candidate right now. It's not because they've interviewed everybody. It's because it's money against money. I mean, that's what they think. Mm -hmm. um, but what I've done is I've taken small donations. I've been taking corporate donations. I, I have enough money. I can fund a decent amount of it myself. That I'm willing to put towards it. I've used lower cost ways to get individuals to hear my message and to hear things. Um, my and I, so through social media, for example, which is a great free opportunity to gain a lot of notice and notoriety, I've excelled at that far more than anybody else right now. Now that's not going to get the people that are on TV and don't see those things and the mailers and the things like that. I'm funding that myself and through small donations, so I am taking that. Also, what I'm doing is unfortunately taking a. Uh, again, I don't want to. No, I'm not going to say that because I'm looking at myself a little bit, but taking advice. For, or taking just looking at national politics and how national politics are. If you get on TV more free advertising, you don't have to spend your money. Right. And I've been doing that. I've been about uh, I've been on TV more so than any other candidate so far. I've been about uh, nine different or ten different interviews, circling Chicago and Southern Illinois, getting my message out. A lot of Republican territory too, and trying to get people to say, you know what, you don't. It's not a Democrat or Republican thing. It's something that we both can work together on and actually create compromise again and not let the partisans left or right dictate what everyone else does. So that's that's one of the things I'm working on right now and that's how I feel like I can go back. Money doesn't always win elections. It gets you to the table, but doesn't always win elections. Just for example, Trump spent fifty percent of what Hillary Clinton spent. JP Pritzker in the nineteen nineties spent ten times what his opponent spent. It didn't win an election. It gets you to the table, doesn't win elections, but I have a strategy between the social media, beyond getting free advertising on the TV, and then going and getting and doing free capital, which is literally going to as many events as I can to get my message out. <coughs> follow up question. All right, follow up question real quick. What's your political what's your background? I mean in terms of yeah. political experience. Yeah. You're 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 asking to go into the highest office in the state yeah. of Illinois. Uh, is this going to be a situation where when you are elected, you turn to your chief of staff and say the following morning, now what do we do now? I'm not uh, Donald Trump. I'm not uh, uh, Bannon, okay? I don't want player. If someone, someone referred to me as that, they're like, I can be your Steve Bannon. I'm like, no, that's a bad first, that's a bad first impression. But my political experience, I so saw through college, again, I'm not going to hide. I mean, the number one Google search of me is my age. I'm 29 years old, okay? So I'm not hiding that. Um, I've been on a lot of campaigns. I've been through a lot of campaigns in Indiana, a lot of Democrats in Indiana, which are tough, tough seats to win. And fortunately, not a lot of people in Indiana vote Democrat. But I've been through that. I've been through policy classes. I've been through a lot of these. And the reason I ran was I knew that no one would stand up for the things that I would stand up for. And a lot of Illinois families would stand up for. They would talk about it, but they wouldn't do it. And I've seen it constantly over and over and over again. And I got frustrated. I said, 
I know me. I know how true and honest. People always ask me about this pinky ring, by the way. It's not a pretentious pinky ring. I don't wear it for fashion. Canadians would understand what this pinky ring is, but it's something that I signed up when I was a civil engineer. You put it on your finger to say, because with a civil engineer, when you draw plans out, you put people's lives in your hands. Because if you build a structure that's not safe, or a road that's not safe, people unfortunately lose their lives. It's one of those things. This pinky ring was a promise of ethics to make sure that everything, no matter what the cost was, no matter what pressure, was that I would do the right thing. And that's why it's on my writing hand, it's the right hand. So again, the pinky ring's not a you know a fancy thing or anything like that, but that's what that is. So I knew that I could do that, and I've seen the politicians in the speech earlier. They, they've not held up. Four of the last seven have gone to jail. I mean, that's not a great statistic to have. I mean, Edgar was the, one of the only recent ones that hadn't gone to jail. Boy, <laughs> did Quinn did not, you know, they didn't find anything on Quinn yet, but they, I don't think they will. But that's, that's one of the things. I knew what my standards were, and I knew what people were telling me and whether they were leaving the state, and I knew a lot of people would say something but not actually mean them. Well, we'll give a new person, and then we'll go yeah, back to you. Yeah, go ahead. Um, do you support the LaSalle Street tax? It would be uh, taxing trades of derivatives on the Chicago Board of Trade or Chicago Mercantile Exchange that would bring billions into the Illinois coffers. And there's a there's a bill in the legislature that's been introduced over, uh, a couple of times at least to put this into place, but it's never brought out of committee. Well, I'll tell you, I'm not too familiar with this, so I'm not going to give you a straight answer, but I, I'm going to give you an answer that would go through like a like what my entire vision of new taxes would be. There's plenty of money out there that is not taxed, that could be taxed, and that tax people that can pay a little more. I mean, Minnesota went to a progressional income tax. They went to and started taxing the rich just slightly a little more, people over a million dollars, a little more than others, and they made money. And guess what? They're out of their, they're out of their debt. Mm -hmm. Things like that, if that's true, and I'm going to look into that, that's something new to me, so thank you for bringing that up. That's the transaction tax, yeah. I believe. And again, you should be familiar with that. And that one so I'm get familiar. yourself familiar. I'm going to get myself familiar with that, sir. But any new taxes, I'd love to see new revenue streams. And again, it's the people that if corporations and the traders can actually pay a little more, which they can, it's a good source of new revenue to Illinois. They don't affect the people that are most vulnerable. Yes, sir. What do you see as the biggest defect in the way the state government currently is run? The current defect is that you have individuals that get paid not on performance but paid on and not performance in the way of like job performance like elections are that right they're supposed to be for you get elected because you do a good job and you keep getting elected because you keep doing a good job my independent likely I would love Democrats in Congress I love <coughs> Democrats as many you know, places as we can get them but you know when two-thirds of Legislature of the legislature is not elected; they're pretty much running unopposed. <laughs> Democracy does not win on location. Again, I'd love Democrats to win as many elections as possible, but there's also that frustration of people to say that these people aren't truly representing me because I don't have another option to do that. Um, and that's one thing that I think the broken system of Illinois is that elections and politicians are not. Um, they're, they're cruising through things, so they're not held accountable for their actions because they don't face opponents. They don't face criticism. Like, for example, right, if Hillary Clinton ran unopposed, she wouldn't have gone and picked up some of the leftist things of Bernie Sanders, right? She would have gone through and, you know, not talked about uh, criminal justice reform, not talked about um, you know, other things, and or like uh, Medicare and health care. She wouldn't have talked about those things, but when you have opponents and have people to, to have conversations with and you have that risk of losing something, you actually listen to people more so than you would if you just said, well, next four years, I'm, no one's going to challenge me. I'm going to win by 90%. What do I care? I'm just going to make sure that I don't have a scandal and end up on TMZ.com. That's it. So that's one thing that's really bothersome right. to me. And I think that's what keep, keep politicians accountable to actually do things that are beneficial to their constituents. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, pre uh, taxes for two years for these little companies. Uh, what's the backup plan? What happens when these guys want to pull out after uh, after two years? Is there some penalty for them to do that, or what? How, how so working? that's what. So unless companies go out of business, you can't unfortunately do anything with that, right? If they go out of business, they go out of business. Um, if they pull out and go to different states, New York also has, a, uh, and this is the same situation like they have with students that go to 
they, they have free education in, uh, in uh, New York. And if students back out, and let, they go to school for four years in New York, and let's say they only spend three years of, of work in New York, or three of their next years in New York, and the fourth year they go to Florida, they pay a penalty for that one year that they didn't go there. And what I see is like where we can get to like free education at some point, obviously you're not gonna be we're in too much debt right now to get to figure that out, is that when these when individuals stay in the state, they're not only paying sales taxes, they're paying property taxes and they're paying income taxes. Well the businesses you say you're yeah. making five new businesses over it and the set up to give them yeah. tax credit for two years. A lot of these guys might call me take advantage of that, make 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 a bundle. Well no, it'd be a similar thing just like the education formula is that they pay a prorated fee. So their taxes they that they would have paid in those years. You make a stipulation, I don't know what that would be right now through okay. the economics, but what it would be is that, let's say you only spend two years here, you get the two years of tax credits, that ends up being $20,000, so let's take that arbitrarily. You leave within a five year, we say that we'll give you two years of tax relief, but you have to stay in the state for five years. Okay. If they leave early, they would pay a penalty or something like that, because you are right, people would take advantage. Everyone takes advantage of whatever they can, especially being Chicago being the hub of everything, Wisconsin is not that far away, and so is Indiana. So a lot of people could take advantage of that system. Yes, sir. Yes, why are you opposed to a public transit bus station? You've mentioned it twice. Mm -hmm. And I think you're referencing the one that I use regularly <laughs> to good take and catch my Amtrak trains and used by thousands of commuters, thousands mm -hmm. of commuters out of Union Station every day. I'm not against public you, transportation. Do you prefer that we get in the, the rain and the snow? No, I don't prefer that. But what I'm saying is that there's ways, you don't see these stations. I'm not allowed to have a place to sit out? Get a rug. Get yeah. a car. Get a car. <laughs> but no, I, I, there's nothing wrong with public transportation. And what they've done downtown looks beautiful. Right? There's there's covers, there's bike lanes, there's this and that. But none of that fun, you don't see any of that in other communities except downtown. Yeah. I mean, what? that's, you don't see, do you see it on the south side or west side? It's nice, beautiful. What about people on the west side? Do, they, do their heads matter that they're getting rained on? I mean, see, that's the thing is that we give unfair advantages to individuals that, and, and locations that are beneficial or deemed more beneficial than others. If they, if they were going to build these nice stations in other communities, and at least even something half the cost, put put a cheaper banister up yeah, so like people they in, don't have 50 commuter trains uh, or 100 commuter trains pulling in with passengers wanting to get on buses in Bridgeport. Mm -hmm. No, I understand. <laughs> but I just say it, it, it's a reflection <laughs> of the communities that they do support. That's what I'm saying, is that individuals, even if there's 10 individuals going on a, a bit, so their their heads don't matter compared to some other people's heads. I understand there's more traffic downtown. I understand that, but I deem it fair that if they're going to invest that money downtown, that they invest a proportionate amount to these other communities and not give it all to the downtown the section. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, were you talking about what Charlie was, when you were, when you were denouncing the, um, the, the bus stations? Yeah. Were you talking about what Charlie was talking about, which is that new transit center they put in at Union Station, or were you talking about those rather over large loop link platforms? That's that, what I was talking about. Yeah, that's what I thought you yeah, were talking about. Yeah, I was talking about those large loop platforms where I see maybe five to ten people even during even during rush hour. There's a decent amount of people there, but they're not meant there for functionality. They're meant there for beautification of the downtown, which is nothing wrong with that, right? But again, distribution of wealth is something that's a big issue in this country, in the state, and in the city, and I would like to see at least some money going to less fortunate communities to help prop those communities up, and if that takes a slight cut to the, you know, the archways and those loop, and those loop stations, a little less nice, that's what I would be able to do. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, how do you feel? A couple things. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel about the service tax, and how do you feel about minimum wage? So, minimum wage... Is one of those things. So I, I say we need to raise minimum wage. All my employees make at least 14 an hour, which I'm, I'm ahead of the national standard. They're not unionized or anything. I just pay them because I can afford to pay them what it is, and they deserve what they can get, right? Um, education is more important to me than minimum wage. I'd raise the minimum wage, but getting a decent education, no matter what that be, whether it be a trade or whether that be college education, those usually lead to higher uh, paying jobs at where people would need minimum wage 
anymore because they'd be making more than minimum wage as is. So minimum wage is just to help people get to a basic cost of living, but funding those educational services, funding kids that want to go to, to you know, union school and things like that, that should be high in our mind because that increases median incomes within Illinois and it also increases the amount of taxes that we can ultimately take in and put in the communities. So that's what I would say. Yeah, go ahead, finish. Uh, service tax. So, like a service tax to like, like uh, in, in lieu of or in addition to sales tax, we don't have a tax company. Yeah. Again, it would be between we were four billion out of budget. The, the past the past budget was four billion out of out of whack, right? And I'm not guaranteeing we can get to a balanced budget. Cannabis would bring anywhere between four and seven hundred thousand, four hundred and seven hundred million dollars. So that's we're four, so that's three and a half. A, a progressive income tax would bring in an additional billion to a billion and a half a year via taxing the millionaires what they actually should be paid. So there's two billion right there. I wouldn't be opposed to it, but I would be I would be open to figuring out where that money would be allocated. In again, I'm not for taxes just to tax. I'd be if those are used to let's say prop up this cost of social services within Illinois, maybe. But again, I'd be more for progressive income tax first, which would tax people that could pay a little more rather than a tax that may affect the poor or the middle class. Okay. Uh, I'll go with you first. Uh, yeah. What's yeah. your position on? developing an independent commission, such as in California, to develop uh, develop the districts, districts, etc. Yeah, I mean, I'm all for that because I'm all for democracy. Like I said, I'd be selfish to say I want all Democrats in power, right? I'd be selfish to say that. But a true democracy, true republic, which we have a constitutional an independent republic. commission. Yeah. yeah, and they have to be independent and make sure they were vetted that they were independent, right? Because a lot of people are independent. Like the you say, the Supreme Court is independent, but let's be honest, the Supreme Court's not truly. There's different interpretations, and again, people have political bias, so they'd have to make sure. And those, and those independent committees. I know Arnold Schwarzenegger was a proponent for that in California when he was governor. He was a Republican. Um, but I, I'd be for that because ultimately, I, I want democracy to win out. I'd be selfish to say that Democrats should, we should have all Democrats, but I'd like to make sure that people have a choice in the state and people that you know, do independent districting. I don't see what hurts. If Democrats really had a great platform to stand on, which I think they do, they win those districts anyway. Okay. Yes, sir. Let's talk about winning. Yeah. The primary election, what demographic uh, will be supporting you? Where do you see your. Yeah. I, I bridged the gap some in some ways, um, and what I've had great success on, which Rob Bogoyevich had, I hate to, again, I hate to reference myself to Rob Bogoyevich. Again, I, got, I don't have as much hair. I got a decent amount of hair, but not as much as he did. Um, I read his book, though. It was like, if I did it, I forgot the governor. The book, if you ever read the book, The Governor, it's kind of like the O.J. Simpson book, If I Did It. But um, ultimately, I, I see myself... With Chicago, I see taking a little bit of Chicago with the youth demographic um, through some of the, the legalization crowd. I've been one of the first proponents of legalization of cannabis within Illinois. Um, down south, I see myself doing really well down there because I have a lot of traditional values. Um, like I said, my family members were union members at one point. Um, I've been able to convince Republicans to switch parties before. And there's a lot of independence in Illinois, actually. Downstate lately, everything seems red. Like, if you look at the map, when Bruce Runner won, it was Cook County, it's blue, and every other county was red. And by going down south, I've been down south about 10, 15 times now. I lost count. I forgot how, whatever you consist in south, Little Springfield. Um, there's a lot of independents out there that vote not with party, but with vote on policy. And getting that policy across is something very, very key to what I plan on doing. And I've had great success um, with a lot of groups and turning, you know, I've actually met with Republican groups down there just because they wanted to they wanted to pick on me. I knew it for a fact. But I did it because I I want to open discussion up. And if they don't agree with me, they don't agree with me. But down south I've had great response and that's where I see myself doing south and also by the uh, quad cities. I've uh, had a lot of time, a lot of effort through the quad cities. And again, those are Republican, you say Republican strongholds. I've convinced people to say this isn't the path that we're going on is not the right path. I think you see you're not you have some good policies, some things I don't agree with. I don't agree with legalization cannabis, I don't agree with this, but you know, ultimately things make sense. So that's where what I have to spend it. Uh well think about it. No, it's it's a big part of demographics. And 
there's nothing wrong with that. I speak a little Spanish. I'm not great at Spanish, but um, I'm, I'm for people of all, everybody. Like, I hate, I hate, I know it's, I know it's a necessity, right? They always have demographics of race and color and things like that. I hate to be like, you just try to talk like against that, but I don't want to be seen as the guy that, oh, I'm going to win the African American vote, I'm going to win the male vote, I'm going to win the female vote, I'm going to win the young vote, things like that. I want to win votes just on policy. Yeah. If people of African American uh, race, people of Hispanic race, um, people of you know, Asian descent, I, I mean, I, I, it doesn't matter to me. So I just want to win the people over policy and action, and that's it. I don't want to skew things into demographics. I know there naturally there is demographics, but I don't want to be seen as that or, or even talk about that, to be honest. Maybe John. Yeah. Yeah, my question is about Holman Square. If yeah. Holman Square was in a white community, there would have been yeah. an uprising. But because it's in a predominantly working class black community, uh, it's easy to pacify the population to think that that's just something that's a one-off. Uh, well, could you talk about how both sides of the aisle are just still just as racist now as they were then? They just have more money to stealthily hide it more. Yeah. Holman Square is pretty serious issue. Well, that's with all communities, right? I mean, there's, there's people no, that... No, it's not with all communities. You don't have torture chambers in all Well, in all societies, you do have the sections where people are caught you know, down, right? They're pushed down. They're not given a chance to succeed. You know, the thing is with... with, with African, let's be honest. I'm going to be totally honest with you with this. Racism still exists. People were not born racist. People were taught racism. I mean, that's a fun fact. I mean, that's a fact. Right? People were born and say, well, I don't like you because you're African American. They're taught that. And you are right. People, when communities are suffering, and certain demographics of communities are suffering, they're not invested into. Chicago let the biggest African American owned credit union fail, which was a staple. I forgot what city that was in, but, or what the neighborhood that was in. But they let it fail. I mean, that's not right. And, and you talk about communities that, and I've been talking about this throughout the speech, is that they're only, when people, no one cares about the poor. I mean, it's true. They, they say black lives matter, you know, gay lives matter, all this, this, but ultimately, when you're poor, no one, no one matters. And that's the, that's the fundamental truth of the things. And we need, again, we need, the, beauty, the, the tourism parts of Chicago bring money. We need to invest in those. But the poor, the poor communities need people, and the politicians need to work with people in those communities to give them something to do, some some form of capital to build something that they want to do in their in their communities. Yeah. Just as a quick follow-up, yeah. one of the things we were told in 2002 and 2003 why we were going to war with Iraq is yeah. that oh. regime was barbaric. I don't. I mean. Uh, so, any new form of job creation within the state of Illinois, I think, is great. I think the the airline industry has lobbied against high speed rail considerably, and. It, it's a it's a cleaner form of, of transportation to be honest with you that I'd love to see enacted. Um, most modern most modern uh, societies, whether it be Japan, China, um, any new high tech uh, Europe, let's take Europe for example, right? They all have high speed trains because it's a cheaper, cost effective, ener more energy efficient way to trans to transport uh, transport people, and I'd be totally for it. But there's a huge lobby against that because there's airline industries, there's Everyone, there's trans different types of transportation industries that don't want to see that. So I would love to see high-speed rail as, a, as an alternative option to air travel within Illinois. Oh, sorry. Do you want me to take that up? I think he had a, this. Yeah. Do you have a question? Yeah. I did. Okay, go ahead, sir. Yeah. Um, this is not a sucker punch. It's okay. Uh, <clears throat> well, I'm in the cannabis business. Yeah. You, I've heard you speak several times about raising three, four, seven hundred dollars worth of tax revenue. Mm -hmm. Illinois has very restrictive uh, conditions for people to become eligible even for medicinal, let yeah, alone recreational. Right. So how, how are you going to get past the lobby that's preventing 
keep us from becoming more like Colorado or California yeah. or Oregon or Washington? I let, first of all, the first thing you need to do is let the people decide, number one, like those states did, Colorado, California, Washington, were all by referendum. And, uh, let those people decide, first, first and foremost. And actually, most people would agree with our position on that. Now, when you actually figure out businesses, there needs to be regulation. You don't want everyone open. It would hurt you as a business if everyone opened a cannabis shop in every corner of every, every street, right? So there needs to be some restrictive conditions that put in place, but those would be done by the lobby and the people of the industry to make sure that they had fair taxes, number one, make sure taxes weren't so outrageous that individuals just buy off the street anyway, number one, and that the licensing of these facilities would have less, there'd be less a restriction to open a business, but there'd be enough to make those businesses accountable to, to make sure that they weren't you know, breaking the law or dispensing things where they shouldn't support. But you were going to ask a separate. Yeah, uh, one of the things that uh, Browner keeps prating about yeah. is uh, term limits. What's your opinion of that? So if we get, if we undo the gerrymandering of and have independent commissions of districts, then there's no purpose of term limits. Okay, I'm, I was for, I'm still battling on the fence. I have it on my website still for term limits. And the only reason I said that initially was because of the amount of seats that are unopposed within Illinois. But if you put an independent commission gerrymander and, and cut off districts fairly, there's no purpose because at that point, the people are choosing your term limits, not individuals. Now, I think executive positions still need to have term limits. Um, I think because every, every, pretty much every state has that already. We do that with the President of the United States, and that gets you new, fresh leadership um, at, the, at the high end level. Um, I'd love to see that. Um, one of the things where I disagree, and again, Mike Batting would hate me saying this, is that the powers of leadership positions in the House and the Senate are, are, are enormous. And, and especially in the House, a lot of people that want to bring up laws have to go through one person to bring up those laws. And that person can dictate what law gets put on the floor and what does not through committees and things like that. I'd love to see that change. And again, it's not a Republican or Democrat thing. It's about a centralizing of power and making sure that individuals that want to actually legislate can offer, uh, be offered that opportunity to freely put uh, laws into committee or potential laws into committees and into general assembly. One I last question over here, we'll go that. to rebuttals. Okay. Okay. Yes. Since you're for competition in politics, um, what's your stance on electoral reform so that more parties could get on the ballot? Yeah, it's actually very tough. Yeah. It's actually very tough in Illinois, and it's tough a lot of places. So I'll give you the, the, the signature requirements, right? And it's actually one of the reasons, I, as you can tell, I have some left policies and I have some right policies. I'm not going to hide that, right? I mean, just when I have some really far left policies, I have some policies that go through the middle, and I have some right. You know, that's just how I am. And it's very tough to even get. So I'll tell you the, the signature requirements in general for governor, and I'll tell you what those are. It's 5,000 for an established party. It's 25,000 for an independent party or an emerging party. So let's say like the Libertarians or like the Constitution Party. Now those are a little far end, maybe really far right ones. Or like the Green Parties and things like that. They have to bring up 25,000. So, and that's a lot. I mean, 5,000 is a lot. It takes an organization to get 25,000. takes an army. And the cost of doing that are anywhere from, um, and then they did this when uh, Gary Johnson, I studied this too, when Gary Johnson got on the ballot, they, the Libertarian Party of Illinois spent $500,000 just to get enough signatures to get that man on the ballot. So it's stacked up against heavily. And mind you, that out of those 25,000 signatures, People can't, that have already signed a petition for the Republican Party or the Democrat Party cannot sign that petition as well. So you talk about these population centers and then people are obviously like what this is about. It's very tough to get your message out. So I like to see reform in that to let more people in place. And talk about campaign finance reform, this is one of the things. I like to see state matching, get big money out of it and state matching of individual contributions. I think that would get a lot of the big money out of politics. Again, to frankly, steal from everyone's pockets and give it to Disney and NBC and Comcast. <laughs> I mean, that's where the money goes. I was talking to these news reporters on ABC, and they're like, I'm like, oh, you guys are going to be making the big bucks this year. Like, they're like, we don't see any of this stuff. You know, all the news reporters, they, they're, the corporate, the, the executives do. So I'd love to see that, too. And I think that's one way that would provide fairer elections. And again, I would, ch challenging and, and tough questions and tough competition make us better. They hold people accountable. 
And if Democrats had great policies and great, which I think they do, and were able to articulate those policies, and same thing with Republicans, if they, I don't, I don't agree with all their stuff, I don't agree with that, but then they should win, ultimately. If they're fair, straight on straight, if everyone's given the same opportunity, ideally, and again, it's not sometimes a reality, but ideally, that person would win. Okay, let's give our speaker a big hand. We're going to read up. You have the final word. Yeah, no problem. Okay, uh, let's have a show of hands, please. And keep okay. your hands up so I can get an accurate count. One, two. Was that a hand up in the blue shirt over there? No. Okay, hands up, please, and hold them up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> Thirteen people. Well, uh, three minutes. Looks like three minutes apiece. We can go. Hey, Charlie, we're not going to run till nine o'clock tonight. We're going to we're going to get out of here and speak. We'll get the last word at about twenty-five to nine. So everybody, come on up. You have three minutes. We'll run the clock. You got it, Andy. Make it talking. Okay. Good evening. Uh, our speaker talked a great deal of, uh, of progressive income tax and raising other taxes and even went so far as to say that uh, we should legalize recreational marijuana uh, for the purpose of even more taxes. I'm all for the legalization of recreational marijuana because I think that everyone should have the right to use it or not use it as an individual. And I don't think the government has any business being involved in it. But when this guy talks about progressive income tax this and progressive taxes that and so on, well, that smacks a great deal of to each according to his need, from each according to his ability, which is terribly Marxist. Uh, what's more, uh, I can remember a time when we didn't have a, t a sales tax on food or on groceries, and uh, we got along very good. But it seems to me that every time that they want to raise taxes, they have all kinds of, of, of beautiful picture painted about how nice it'll be once we have that particular tax installed. But really, I mean, we were going to have everything hunky-dory after we had brought in the lottery, and the lottery was going to fix it for the schools and everything else, and it didn't fix anything. So, uh, and here we are every time, right back in the same six and seven, with some politicians saying, if I'm elected, then I'm gonna make everything much better. It'll just be hunky-dory when I get in. But the wind-up is, that never happens. And uh, I wanna say that uh, uh, when we have a, uh, a politician who gets up and talks before the people, uh, I think he should be very careful what he says. <laughs> For example, when a politician says uh, the Chicago land area, that sounds like he's not very well educated because the proper word is the Chicago land or the Chicago area. No one says the Chicago land area. That's improper speech and that purports that the man is not very well educated. And if he's not very well educated, we certainly don't want him representing us. And that's it. It's amazing how many people want to save people who might have to pay too much tax. Well, guess what? My income is about fifty to sixty thousand dollars a year, and I paid this for state income tax. So I am undertaxed. But if I am undertaxed, what about Ken Griffin? His wealth is seven point five billion dollars. 
if I got my thousands in order, that's 7,500 millions. I'd say he is undertaxed. I don't want to say he's the only one. I think there's some other people who are undertaxed, uh, even me. But hey, there are plenty of people with lots of money, and guess who was one of the biggest contributors to our governor, Ken Griffin. And I don't say Ken Griffin is the only one, but hey, uh, there are plenty of people like that. Jane Adams Senior Caucus and other groups are going to walk to Springfield. Again, I'm only walking seven and a half miles, but I'm sure during that time we will talk to a lot of Republicans and maybe some of those Republicans from downstate will wake up and realize that we have a governor who one columnist uh, uh, talked about, it's hard to bargain with somebody who's got everything they want. I'd say the governor wants no budget. That's helping the rich, isn't it? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Speaker. Oh, yeah, I got you. This is from 1987. Uh, those of you who survived the 80s, I salute you all. Why do you need to wreck this country? And I'm kind of paraphrasing. There's no poetic license in this. Why do you need to wreck this country? Because it's wreckable, all right? I took another look at it and it changed my mind. If these people lose their jobs, they got nowhere to go. So tell me, Gordon, or uh, tell me, Bruce, tell me, Donald, fill in your blank for this one. When does it all end, huh? How many yachts can you water ski behind? How much is enough? It's not a question of enough. It's a zero-sum game. Somebody wins and somebody loses. Money itself isn't lost or made, it's simply transferred from one perception to another, like magic. This painting here, I bought it for 10 years ago for 60000 I could sell it today for 600 The illusion has become real. And the more real it becomes, the more desperate they want it. Capitalism at its finest. How much is enough for you? Look, the richest 1% of this country owns the majority of the wealth. One third of that approximately comes from hard work, two thirds comes from inheritance, interest on interest, accumulating widows and idiot sons and what I do. Stock and real estate speculation. It's BS. You got 90% of the American public out there with little or no net worth. I create nothing. I own. We make the rules, pal. The news, war, peace, famine, upheaval, the price of a paper clip. We pick that rabbit out of the hat while everybody sits out there wondering how the hell we did it. Now, you're not naive enough to think we're living in a democracy now, are you? It's the free market, and you're a part of it. And uh, that's where we're at today. Rosa Luxemburg. Since we're going to demonize socialism so much. Without general elections, without unrestricted freedom of press and assembly, without a free struggle of opinion, life dies out in every public institution because a mere semblance of life in which only the bureaucracy remains is the active element, not the dictatorship of the people, but only the dictatorship of a handful of politicians. And uh, I look forward to hearing what everybody else has to say. All right. All right. Yeah. I'm a Vietnam veteran, and I get my medicine from the VA. I call them up, and they say, the first thing they say is, if you're considering suicide, press one. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha, you laugh, but more veterans, the Vietnam veterans, have killed themselves that were, injured, that were killed in the war. 
It's just, it's just something that's sort of, you know, that's not my main point. My, my main point is, a hundred years from now, it's going to be a different world. We're all going to be dead. But what is the vision for the, for the future generation? We need to think about, we need to think about the vision now. Because there's going to be, all these cars out here, they're not, they may be sitting there, but they're not going to be, you're not going to be using them. It's going to be a different world. So what's the vision? Okay, Braj. My name is Raj Patel. Somehow it gives me a feeling that I could have heard this speech four years back, ten years back, fifteen years back. It looks like a democratic party and politics works in Illinois and continues like that. Uh, with the age of Alex, I had expected some revolutionary ideas, some extravagant changes, like 30% cut in a way healthcare is provided, revolutionary idea of cutting, providing education at lower prices, improving uh, transportation and uh, taking a strong stand on a high speed transportation. But I did, I did not hear that emphasize. I hear I heard lots of politics. And uh, other thing I hear, which was not good, Chicago, you win Chicago, you have a chance to win in Illinois. If you don't win Chicago, you don't have a chance to win Illinois. And no candidates should ever forget about Illinois wide office. It's very important, you know. The lots of it is very very difficult to pass legislation in a Illinois Senate or even anywhere or or a assembly con Congress or anywhere. And uh, I don't know whether you have enough experience uh, with the people. Uh, to negotiate deals, you know, but right now they don't have that. And so to have that, you have to have extraordinary skill of dealing with the people, you know, and negotiating it, taking your strong position where compromising and personal dealing willing. And I did not, I, I did not feel that, okay, I'm sorry. I did not, I did not feel. I, I, I suggest something that, uh, if you think your budget is your important, important thing, so start talking to lots of people, call them up who are expert in Illinois, an issue you are concerned about, and say, hey, I'd like to talk to you, you know, I'm running for a governor, and uh, you know, can I talk about an issue because I think you are good at that, let me talk. When, when, when I was, in, I was a, out of job at a low point in my life, in the very beginning, after uh, getting my green card, and I did not know to go for business or to go for a job. So I called up uh, the chancellor of Northwestern University in a, a Evanston. And uh, his secretary I talked to, he said, look, I'm a young man, I want to talk to you about my career. You know, can I talk to the chancellor? And she said, give me your number and uh, call me back a couple of days after, I'll talk to him. I, I called back and he gave me half an hour time to talk to him. I think, I think it is surprising that we don't realize how much people want to help who are qualified and, and I think you should take advantage and do more learning experience. It's lots of time you have still to election and uh, if you prepare yourself and don't, don't underestimate governor. I tell you something, I have been all my life, read Jewish man, <laughs> he's opponent. You, you better prepare. They play to win. Donald Trump played to win. He did not play the issue like uh, Hillary Clinton did. Okay, and then, okay, then your, your issues are good, you will succeed. But you play to win, and so far, you are not planning to play to win. Thank you. Thanks, Raj. Yeah, let's play that in. All right. Mr. Sid Cohen. When I was a kid, I used to work at Sears. I guess they call it Holman Square now. But on the way to work, 
you would pass all kinds of factories. The west side, where I live, was booming with factories. The same thing with the south side. I, just take, I used to take Western Avenue to work all the way south, and there used to be a lot of factories, a lot of uh, businesses there. If you look at it now, it's like a wasteland. So our whole economy is going down. At first, they moved a lot of these plants to the south, especially uh, manufacturing of clothing, cotton, and so forth and so on. They moved to the south because there was no labor unions there. And after a while, with the internet and the in and the advances of technology, they found out they could move to, to, to China, Pakistan, all these various countries, and hardly pay them anything. And they would make fabulous profits. Now they got what they call neoliberalism. What they do is pay private things, not private, but like schools and anything the government owes that was built up during the New Deal, and they can even make a higher profit with this neoliberalism by taking over these, these factories and these places of business by millionaires and they could even make more money. So the whole thing is maximizing profit. And as long as we can't have that type of system by just maximizing profit and not caring a damn about working people, they look upon them as just another commodity. If they could use them and make a higher profit, that's what they'll do. They destroyed the labor unions for the most part. Very few people belong to labor unions, which brought us progress. They destroyed that, and now they're going all over the world fighting wars in the Middle East so they can make profit there. So they don't really care about the average working people. It's all they care about is a handful of people that are billionaires. It's all they really care about. In order to uh, maybe make some progress, we need something like the New Deal where the government comes in and takes over these businesses and puts people back to work like it was done under Roosevelt. But now, they don't even want to do that. They got rid of Bernie Sanders. They didn't want him because exactly that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to reform capitalism. And some people running for office want to reform capitalism, which is not a bad thing in itself if it puts people back to work. So I'd, I'd say I'd probably vote for the speaker because of that. I found most of what the speaker say had to be interesting, but there were too many generalities well, no, there, too many things that I've heard from other politicians, decision. that's number one. And I hear nothing there about how, or I would say I don't know that I heard that much about how he's going to try and work with the legislature, because like it or not, Mike Madigan is going to be probably the speaker of the House next time around too. And John Cullerton's still going to be Senate President. And any bill that that goes to the legislature to get us a budget finally, that's going to have to go to them. And that means that, that whoever becomes governor after the next election is going to have to negotiate with them. And that's part of the problem. Ron Rocker doesn't want to negotiate. And as has been pointed out, it meets his criteria just fine. He can cut out all this stuff because he doesn't have a budget. The other things that I heard that I was concerned about are, one, that we need a commission to redistrict the legislature. 
We didn't hear about this when the Republicans were running the legislature. We only heard it after the Democrats took over. And so that strikes me as a lot of Republican propaganda. Now, perhaps I should lay my cards on the table here. I am a long time Chicago and Cook County Democrat. Believes that big government is good, little government is bad. And, and um, as for third parties, they, it is true that while I voted for John Anderson in 1980, which, is, which was an anomaly that I hope will not have to be repeated, <laughs> um, I happen to believe that third parties exist for one purpose. They exist to cause problems, as we have seen with Ralph Nader. And I'm all in favor of the restrictions that the elder Mayor Daley had the legislature put into place to keep them off the ballot. And I'm all in favor of continuing that. Now, granted, when I'm in a smart, smart alec mood as I am tonight, then I almost get tempted to urge the election of somebody like Paul Powell as the next governor. <laughs> What's his name? Paul Powell. A gentleman with the shoeboxes. No, He'll okay. we'll get it. It's okay. Yes, most of us who remember Illinois politics in about 45 or 50 years ago, yeah, we remember as they pronounced it in his part of the state, Paul, pal. <laughs> okay. Next. To some, much is given. Of those, much is expected. If this sounds like a Marxist phrase, it's not. It comes straight out of the Bible. Oh. Franklin Roosevelt, as a matter of fact, uh, made it famous uh, during uh, one of his uh, fireside chats and during uh, part of his inaugural address. Uh, it's a truth that stands just as true as it did 4,000 years ago and as it did in 1932 when Franklin Roosevelt addressed an America that was perhaps not so divided since the Civil War. We still live in a divided country, and we live in a divided country partly because of the fact that the two major parties have fallen down on the job. I expect the Republicans to effectively represent uh, the plutocrats, and I expect the Republicans to effectively represent the people that were born with silver and platinum spoons in their mouth. But the Democratic Party, since the days of FDR, had been expected to be the party of labor unions, the party of the workers, and it fell down on the job. The reason Donald Trump became our unexpected president was because of the fact that the Democrats, never mind who the candidate was, the Democrats forgot who they represented, what their job was. And consequently, they lost the ball game this time around. It's unfortunate, but it's true. No. Now, we've always been a two-party system, even back in the days of Thomas Jefferson. Those two parties have shifted. I'm very much in favor of a continued two-party system. However, the need may arise when one party may have to be substituted for another in that two-party system. In which case, speaking only for myself, I would like to see a workers' party, a labor party of some kind. This isn't radical. This isn't socialist. Uh, this isn't communist, certainly. You will find most of the countries of uh, the Western world have a fairly strong labor party. This is true in Ireland. This is true in France. This is true in Germany. Uh, they call themselves the Christian Democrats over there. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, there, there is this party more effectively representing working people. The reason so many people are up late at night worrying about how am I going to live now that my health care, now that my insurance has been pulled out from under me, 
in a country like the United States, the richest, most powerful empire since Rome at its highest, this is, shouldn't even be a discussion that needs to take place in this country. Uh, I'm not a big fan of Rahm Emanuel. I was when he was a congressman. And he told me once, while we were sitting down just BSing, that probably national health care in this country could be achieved simply by expanding Medicare as we know it, with some modifications. These are the kinds of issues that the Democratic Party, over the next four years, as it licks its wounds, these are the kinds of issues that it's going to have to deal with. And let us hope that we do not get lost in all kinds of platitude and that we do not let the ivory tower theoreticians take over. Let us hope that we have some input from real workers and from real unions. And incidentally, the reason unions in this country have uh, fallen into disuse has been laziness. Well, consider. Guys join a union, they figure, oh well, the shop steward will take care of that. I'm not going to bother to go to the meetings. All of a sudden, the shop steward finds himself uh, promoted. He's an executive, and who represents the workers? These are the kinds of things, even where I worked at the Learner newspapers, I saw time and time again. Unless you have people who are willing to stand up, represent themselves, uh, and others like them, you're going to have this go on and on and on. People do get what they deserve. And let this be a lesson to us over the next four years. You know, uh, a famous uh, dissident, Joe Hill, as he was being led to a firing squad in Utah for a crime he did not commit, his last words were, don't mourn, organize. To the Democrats today, I would say, don't mourn the results of the last election. Organize. Thank you. Yeah. Pat Butler has uh, drawn me away from tonight's topic a little bit and into the election. Um, I think he hit on one of the reasons the Democrats lost, but the most important reason I think they lost it. They still haven't figured out, Democrats and most people still haven't figured out why Donald Trump won. And um, they think that if the election were held again today, he would lose because people would come to their senses. Uh, I, I don't think that's true. And I, 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 I'm sad to say if things don't change, we might actually have eight years of Donald Trump. I hope that doesn't uh, happen. But it's anger. There's incredible anger among, in the American electorate. And when people are angry, they'll do strange things. A little bit like the horses running back into the burning barn. Um, anyway, regarding, uh, to, oh, I, I myself voted for Jill Stein. Uh, had, because I believe in, in multiple parties. I think we'd be better off if we had many parties the way many European countries do. <laughs> had I lived in Wisconsin or Michigan, or any of the other so-called swing states, I would have voted for Hillary Clinton. Watch yourself. But uh, uh, certainly would not have voted for Donald Trump, even even though I'm sympathetic to his voters and their anger. Uh, regarding tonight's uh, speaker, I think this uh, gentleman has a, a possible career in politics. Uh, I like a lot of what he says. He's much in favor of progressive income taxes as opposed to regressive sales and, and other taxes. And taxes and income distribution have always been one of the issues uh, of importance to me. Uh, I think he needs a little seasoning, and I think he's going to have a hell of a time fighting the Pritzker money this, this time around. But I would encourage you to stick with it for many years to come, and at some time you may have a future there. Uh, I'll end with a little, uh, David Zucker brought up Paul Powell, who uh, a few of us here remember, and a few of us here may remember, uh, those who don't, won't get the joke, but uh, Paul Powell died in office, and my understanding is what happened is, is he went into his closet, pulled out a shoebox, opened it, and there was a pair of shoes in it. <laughs> <laughs> Ha 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 ha!
Good evening, dear friends of Flint Barney. I'm not into politics, but I'd like to wish all the mothers here a happy Mother's Day. And all to all the guys I wish to be a first wish you happy great grandfather's day. <laughs> Today, uh, in the Sun Times, uh, they had a cartoon by Dennis the Menace. He's, his mother is holding him, and he says, Without me, Mom, Mother's Day would just be an ordinary day. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> love, uh, uh, in the uh, Barton's book of quotations, love is the most quoted uh, word, and next is life. And I am, uh, and what is life, what is love? <clears throat> Life is one full thing. Hold it, hold it. Yeah, no, life is one full thing after another, and love is two full things after each other. <laughs> See, they say the love makes the world go round. I think ideas and maybe quotations makes the world go round. And um, I'm, I'm uh, timing myself because, you know. Time's up. Uh, time's up. That's what happens in, in, in Oak Park. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Oak Park, where I can't speak for 30 seconds, and they rush me. On, uh, they, they, there's a mass in um, a gymnasium, they get petitions. But on Super Bowl Sunday, I want to tell them the, 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 the patron saint of football. And 53 guys, I'm up there 15 seconds, two guys in the priest. They rushed me, and I had no time to tell them who the patron saint of football. I told, told you once here, it's St. Lawrence. St. Lawrence was uh, uh, roasted on the gridiron. <laughs> okay, and um, now ten words. Um, quotation made the world go round. Now three weeks ago, I said sixteen words. I hope you remember them. Uh, eat it up, wear it out, make it do, do it out. Waste not, want not, those 16 words. Eat it up, wear it out, make it do, do it out. Waste not, want not. On uh, uh, the uh, uh, equality day. Uh, okay, here's, here's uh, 10 words that you should remember. If it is to be, it is up to me. 10 two-letter words. If it is to be, it is up to me. Bingo. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Thank our speaker for finding him. Let's best of luck in the upcoming campaign. I'll be eclectic as usual here, and I'll try to be coherent. I <laughs> wasn't coherent. Good luck, Chuck. Uh, first of all, we got a long-standing dispute here regarding this fancy bus stations in the loop which is actually a bus rapid transit line. And what they do is have a dedicated lane for certain buses, and the passengers go to a station and get on a bus, instead of having the bus stop at every single corner. And that delay is because you have the bus stops, box traffic, people get on, there's a certain term for that. Um, if you have it centralized, a station type of concept, it expedites travel. Now you can debate whether it's worth the expense or not, uh, but uh, certain transit people feel this uh, speeds up travel. Now there's a give back that you have to walk to a particular station as opposed to having a bus stop on every other block in the loop and congestion and things like that. Um, I don't know either way on it, but I don't think it's an extravagant expenditure. Uh, and, and those that transportation experts seem to think that it's worth the investment in speeds along the commute and frees the lanes up for uh, other people in the loop. Think about service to the neighborhoods, uh, bus routes go quite a ways, and there's no such thing as a bus route that serves, it might be one or two we know of, but uh, there's no such thing as a neighborhood bus route. They travel some distances, uh, so it's a little hard to ascertain. Uh, there are services. The major thing uh, regarding neighborhood service is 24-hour service 
uh, or weekend service, uh, off peak service. Uh, the, you want you want to avoid the transit system that is rush hour only uh, services that. So I don't I don't have anything regarding the bus stations downtown. Uh, as a matter of fact, that might even be better because. It used to be, we used to have a lot of buses that went downtown, and they cut them off, and now you end up taking a bus, and it ends up at a train station, and you have to get on the train in order to get downtown. Um, I don't really follow too much Illinois politics. Uh, this, the things I have attended, however, uh, seem to, Mr. Rauner is kind of strong-armed in enforcing uh, discipline among the, at least the members of the Republican Party. They're not authorized under any circumstances to vote against his decision making. And I don't believe that's the case with the Democrats or ever has been. If you vote contrary to Mr. Rauner's views and opinions, I was told there will be a candidate running against you in the next election. You will be primaried out. Uh, and that I don't think is the ultimate aim of good government. Anyhow, uh, the other thing about uh, transit is the major thing is we don't want increase in service. Uh, we don't want any cuts in service or increase in cost. That's the major thing. Regarding the neighborhoods, that's a, neither here nor there. And by the last, oh, I won't get into it. Yeah, you're such a union guy. All right, you're such a big union guy, huh? Right? Butler here. <laughs> All right. If you're a real union guy, which eye was Big Bill Hill missing? Uh, I don't know. I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't there when they shot <laughs> <got it. laughs> <laughs> And his name was <laughs> Joe Hill. Oh, no. Big Bill Thompson, rather. Oh, Big Bill Thompson. Oh, yeah. I'll go next. Uh, yeah, if you scab. I will say this and this only. The only thing necessary for evil is for good men to do nothing. And that is why we are in the state that we are in. I think a lot of our citizenry has lost their appetite for participation in civic affairs. Voting um, and running for office and taking a good amount of what they need to do. If you really want to change things, if you really want to do things well, you have to get back involved in politics. Now I know this particular audience here at the college is very well aware of the ramifications and the views because most of you are active in politics. This is addressed to our internet audience. If you have a gripe yeah. no. and you don't have, be part of the solution. Don't be a cynic and sit on the sidelines. I have an uncle. He prides himself that he never voted at all. So. And yet, he is one of the biggest beneficiaries of government programs around. I obviously have some trouble with him. In the former Yugoslavia, there's a group called Optor. They were the ones who started what they called the Revolutionary Training School to get rid of dictators who didn't, and their main goal was if they don't have the consent of the powerful, if they don't have the consent of the people who govern them, if they're in power and they're not, and they're not going through it, it's just, you know, it was restarted by a book from a gentleman who's named from the Albert Einstein Institute in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm forgetting his name right off the thing, but the book is called From Dictatorship to Democracy. Its whole premise is that if you take back your government and you take, you know, you can overthrow governments by not supporting them. 
even if it is a dictatorship, because there are a certain number of cooperation and things that have to happen for those governments to survive and thrive. If we in the United States would take a much more active interest in what we're doing and how we're doing it and why we should care, let's face it, <coughs> evil's all around us. And if good men do nothing, evil will prevail. I think in a lot of cases we're starting to see that now. I support what Edward Brooke said. All it takes for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. Evil. I got two on oh, two minutes. I got yeah. You, you well, only three minutes. I clock. Yeah. I, no, clock. I, I got. I sat down at two fifty. Uh, dear sisters and uh, dear, dear friends of Sim Brundage, our father, seekers of truth, one and all, and finders of a new facet of truth now and then, here and there, in this or that statement or event, to improve the quality of life. We have come here to learn the truth to improve the quality of life. What did he say? He said, dear uh, friends of Slim Brundage, seekers of the truth. And finders of a new facet of truth, now and then, here and there, in this or that statement or event, to improve the quality of life. And what is life? Life is one full thing after another. Love is two full things after each other. Now, three weeks ago, I said, I told you, three weeks ago, and uh, uh, it, 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 great Sir Charles Warner says, I'm not going up there because I want to speak over on August the 13th. August 6th is the six, uh, 600 and 66 years point six here. I want to talk about the 666, the Antichrist. And uh, we're here 66 years in point six uh, tenths. And also, we, we, on uh, uh, Mother's Day, we should be talking about mothers. On Father's Day, we should talk about fathers. Yeah. On Super Bowl Sunday, we should talk about who's the, about the Super Bowl coming up. Really? And on uh, 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 Basketball, the final four. We should talk about who and about the final four. Have topics like that. Amen. Thank you. All right. Charles, Charles over there. I think Charles retired from work. I think it's high time Charles retired from the uh, from the college here. Yeah. Somebody else takes over. He's been there for about 35 years. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you for your comments. And he's doing a good job, too. I nominate uh, Pat Butler to take over. Charlie's so Charles doing a good job. He's got speakers. Six Butler, are you game? It's a curfew. Uh, Charles is doing an excellent yeah. job as it is. Yeah, but people walking out here, I don't know. Why. That's because oh, well, that, they that's got the rebuttal time. Uh, people don't, a lot of people don't stick around for the rebuttals. That's because they're cut stupid like the one you just did. Okay, um, if everybody is... I'll be very brief tonight. Um, I have an idea to offer um, that hasn't been talked about a lot, but um, some of my favorite books are uh, science fiction stories about uh, future, how humans would handle things in the future. Well, for the Illinois problem with our budget deficit, what I would do if I were governor I would, I would hold a, uh, a ball, I would invite the top 200 richest people in Illinois, the top 200, get them in one big ballroom, have a nice dinner, steak, lobster, everything else, and have enough armed guards, private security on the premises to lock all the doors after dinner and, and make an announcement, say, here's what we're going to do tonight. You guys talk amongst yourselves. And before we open the doors and let you go home, we're going to raise out of your bank accounts, to every, whatever you want to contribute, the $700 billion deficit. Uh, we expect you 200 to fork up the money because you've been living off transferring the wealth. You've been living in a wealth transfer machine where wealth has been transferred from the poor, middle class, union workers the middle class has been in the process of being wiped out in this country for the last 30 years to make what used to be called millionaires and multimillionaires. Now they're billionaires, and many of them are up in the class of billionaire predators. And um, Professor John McMurtry wrote a book in 1999, a Canadian, 
the book was called The Cancer Stage of Capitalism. And he says, if you don't regulate what Martha Stout talked about in her book, The Sociopath Next Door, one in 25 is a sociopath with no ethics, no morals, and no conscience. If you let those, that 4%, if you let them become billionaires, and then multi-billionaires, they'll be like sharks getting bigger and bigger and bigger. They will finally just uh, get bigger and bigger and bigger and grow like a cancerous tumor that eats everything in sight and will destroy a society. Now, that book was published in 1999, you know, 18 years ago, and there's been dozens of books published since echoing his analysis, which is right on the money. Today, uh, last week I talked about the medical uh, media pharmaceutical complex where a for-profit medical system, no, prop, no amount of profit is ever enough. If you can make a bottle of pills uh, for 10 bucks and sell it for $500, that's fine, but let's charge 2000 What about 5000 uh, Our system is designed to take as much money as you can off people that can't defend themselves, and when they have no more money, you let them die. That's the medical industrial complex in America today. We stand alone on the planet running that kind of system. And I applaud our speaker tonight for wanting to address issues like that, fundamental issues of fairness and justice. So um, let's think outside the box a little bit. Uh, last thing, the U.S. military today is publishing studies saying the number one threat against America is climate change and global warming. It's not terrorism or anything else. We need a World War II type mobilization for four years, five years, like we mobilized in World War II to win that war. We need to do that now where industry retools to get off of fossil fuel. If the kids that are little today are gonna to have any kind of a chance living on a survivable planet by the time they're our age. So, Let's give our speaker a good hand and hope that hope for his success and hope that he gets elected governor. Thank you. The speaker has the last word. The speaker has the last word. There be many words. Follow up. Uh, we got we got 15 minutes. 15 so minutes. All right. First off, I want to say thank you guys for everything. I mean, this is to be honest with my unique, most unique experience that I've had. <laughs> uh, and it's a good thing because there's not a lot of forums like this where people have differing opinions. Uh, I still say it's Chicagoland area, so I don't apologize for that. But, and bus, bus terminals won't go away, I swear. Just, just yours. But no, I'm kidding. But anyway. Um, I got my own bus stop. All right. But anyway, no. But these, you know, these sessions are far, yeah. few and far between, and you guys are doing something very good here, and, and it's amazing. So thank you guys for having me today. You know, I hope over this, you know, we have a long way to go before even the primary elections, and I hope you guys get to know who I am and hopefully understand how genuine I am in this. And I, I know how I've been lied to multiple times by politicians. I can only imagine you guys when you've been through, right? I mean, everyone is, and you're seeing this guy come up here and saying, uh, he's just saying it because everyone else is trying to say it and everything like that. But I hope to earn your guys' trust and hope to earn, you know, and even if you disagree with me, that you know I'm genuine in what I'm doing and why I'm doing the things that I am. So I hope, I hope to earn that from you guys at some point. You know, I love Illinois. I've lived here my entire life. I didn't go to school in Illinois because it's actually more expensive to go to school in Illinois than it was to go to actual uh, Purdue University. And talk about the future. This state is going to lose everybody. We're going to Chicago. It's a, here's a fun fact: Chicago will be the fourth largest city in the United States behind Houston, Texas, within the next 10 years. And that's because of the mass migration that's occurring. My generation, your generation, everyone is leaving the state, and that's sad because I love the state so much. And what I plan on doing is not only correcting our issues, making a balanced budget, making sure that we're fiscally responsible, but having programs that keep people in this state, such as education, investing in our kids, not throwing them to the wolves and saying, go fend for yourself. Secondary education that teaches kids and teaches individuals 
that for these new jobs that are coming, these self-automated, when jobs are lost to the automated everything, that they will have the education yeah. needed to fight in the new economy that will take place so that they don't have to rely on social services, welfare, unemployment, that they'll have a good, high-paying job. That we have a minimum wage that's livable minimum wage, but only but investing in this education so that the minimum wage won't matter anymore because people will make higher median income because they have an education, have good paying jobs, that pay taxes, that have that can afford homes. Because most of my you generation, I don't know if you know you guys know this, most of my generation, I'm lucky to have a home of my own, but they're still living with their parents. I mean that's a that's a big yeah. burden. That's a that's a that's a tough hope for a lot of kids that don't understand that that won't ever have the opportunity of buying a home until they're 35, 36. It won't be able to afford a car if they want a car. That they're living still off their parents' house. And I'm sure their parents love that. But um, that, that don't see that hope, and I want to bring that hope, and that's, I'm, our generation was lied to. We say, you go to college, you're going to get a good paying job. It doesn't matter what degree you're going to get, you're going to get a good paying job. It was a total fallacy, a total lie, and educating kids at high school that you know, using your hands is not a sin. You can get a great paying job doing that. That's my vision for that. Vision for business in Illinois, making corporations accountable to their hiring goals, making sure that they say they're going to get a tax break, they're going to hire 5,000 people, you're going to hire 5,000 people, or you're going to pay us those taxes that we gave back to you. Allowing small businesses to grow and to thrive and investing in those people that want to start businesses in Illinois and stay in Illinois. So those are the type of things that we need to do. And protecting the poor, protecting the middle class that, again, all politicians talk about but no politicians actually care about. Again. When it comes to the poor, no lives matter to a lot of people and a lot of politicians, and that's not right. That's not right. Investing in communities, like I said, is that the bus stations are just a metaphor for the bigger issue, which is that the city of Chicago invests heavily in the beautification of Chicago, but then in other in the downtown area, but then in other communities don't give those communities another chance, or the funding, or the support to build those communities. Instead, they close schools down, they and they take away social centers and pretty much drive people to the only option, which is crime, that we have in this, in this great state, which I don't, I don't like kids going down the wrong path or starting out with a, um, a disadvantage. So I appreciate, again, everyone's input. I'm taking everything to heart. I took notes. I'm keeping everything here. If you want to reach out to me, my email is alex at alexpaterakis.com. I'll leave that with everybody. I do videos all the time. So what you're going to see, which no other, nobody will do, I don't care if you agree with me, disagree with me, whatever that is, I'm going to put out videos on my YouTube and Facebook pages on the web that literally state, here's, my, here's the policy that I'm addressing, here's what the policy is, here's why I like or disagree with the policy, here's how we pay for said policy, and that's it. You're going to have something to react to. No one else will do that that's going to differentiate me and ultimately get our vision through and influence people to change this great state. So again, thank you so much for staying around. And uh, you just let me know if you guys need anything or need help with anything. Just close us out and say college adjourned. College adjourned. All right. Thank you. It's important to see things outside of bar, in the box. It's important to see things inside the box. People are leaving here because they're bored to tears. Isn't it? People are leaving here before it's over. They're bored to tears. Isn't that right, Sir Charles in charge? Are you a guest supporter? me. Yes. <laughs> I didn't have a we should have a, a conference on how to eliminate concussions in football. No. And, and Excuse me, sorry. They're being sued eight billion dollars. No, they and don't. Have how to speed up baseball. What? That's a today, for those who may not know, today is the 100th anniversary of the apparition of Fatima. Uh, and the cup. And a, and a, in, that's right. 2017 is a 500 and a, and a anniversary, the 500 year anniversary of the, the White Sox are winning. Martin Luther. When are we going to have a conference on Martin Luther? Uh, uh, yeah. communication. They've had endless discussions on Martin Luther before.